So in today's video, um, it's actually a three-part video. Uh, I noticed in the comments of my last video about the uh, analysis of the fuel injector waveform and why there is an inductive spike. Uh, I noticed in the comments some people said that they wanted to know more about the MOSFET and want more about the uh, control of the fuel injector. Uh, I started making that video and I realized there's a lot more that I wanted to talk about in that context. So I started to break it up into three separate videos. I'm going to be uploading them all at the same time. So uh, within maybe 20 minutes of the first upload, I will uh, have all of these videos uploaded and you can uh, choose between them. So the first one is going to be uh, fuel injector pulse width and how the computer calculates the pulse width. Second is the actual physical ECU control of the fuel injector and how that works. And then uh, the inner workings of a MOSFET. Uh, going to do a video specifically addressing that. So you can, uh, this video is the fuel injector pulse width video. So if you want to click here or here, it will take you directly to that video. Okay, that's plenty of time. Let's get started. So to get started about how the computer calculates how much fuel should be injected into an engine, we should uh, talk about our atmosphere or the air that's uh, all around us right now. Uh, if you're on Earth, 78% uh, of the air uh, or the air molecules around you are actually uh, nitrogen, 21% are oxygen, and 1% is other, uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, etc., many different things. Uh, here I have represented uh, the, uh, the molecules just to show you kind of how the ratios are. You can see most of it is 78% nitrogen, completely inert. Almost nothing uh, uses nitrogen to live. The only use that I know of is uh, nitrogen fixing for bombs and nitrogen fixing for fertilizer. Uh, other than that, the nitrogen is almost never used. Uh, the oxygen is what we use. We as animals, uh, mammals, we use oxygen to breathe. And oxygen is also necessary for internal combustion engines. Uh, gasoline reacts with oxygen to burn. So the first thing we need to understand is that the air is mostly nitrogen, but about one-fifth oxygen. And that brings me to my next point, stoichiometric. The stoichiometric ratio of air to fuel is 14.7 to one for gasoline. What that means is that you need 14.7 times more air than gasoline to be able to burn it completely. If you had less air, then you would have uh, incomplete combustion and not all of the uh, hydrocarbons in the gasoline would burn. If you had too much air, uh, not all of the oxygen would be used and you would have oxygen left over after you burned all the gasoline. So stoichiometric is what's considered the perfect ratio, 14.7 uh, to one. Now this isn't what all engines use and it's not appropriate all the time, but that's this is gonna be uh, our baseline. You can actually adjust the ratio depending on the needs of the current needs of the engine and the computer does indeed do that. It does change the ratio uh, quite a bit, but it doesn't really matter for the math we're doing. We're just gonna start with a 14.7 to one, but just know that this uh, method applies to any fuel ratio that you desire. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the density of air and gasoline. Uh, air has a density of 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. What that means is that if you had a cubic meter of air or a cube that's one meter on each side, the air inside of that would weigh 1.225 kilograms. The same thing with fuel. If you had a cube of fuel that is one meter on each side, it would weigh a whopping 719.7 kilograms. So obviously fuel is much, much more dense than air. In fact, Gasoline is 587.5 times more dense than air. So some people will tell you, um, who know about the 14.7 to one air fuel ratio, they'll tell you that you need 14.7 liters of air for every one liter of fuel. That is 100% incorrect. This is not the case. If you were to use one liter of fuel for every 14.7 liters of air, you would use so much more fuel. Your miles per gallon or your uh, kilometers per liter or whatever uh, measure, uh, measure of a uh, mileage you use would be so so low it'd be completely ridiculous this is not what's true so what is true 
Well, the air fuel ratio is not measured with volume, like liters or gallons or cubic centimeters. It's measured by mass. So kilograms, grams, pounds, whatever you use to measure uh, mass. That is what this is referring to. And since gasoline is so much more dense than air, you need, by volume, you need a tiny, tiny amount of gasoline for a given volume of air. If you were to go, go back to this example here, let's say you really did have 14.7 liters of air. Let's say you had 14.7 liters of air and you wanted to know how much fuel you need uh, to react with all the oxygen in that air. You would need 0 0.025 liters of gasoline. And the way I came up with that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is incorrect. Um, the 0 0.025 liters of gasoline is the uh, equivalent uh, mass of 14.7 liters of air. What I mean by that is that if you have 14.7 liters of air and you put it on a scale, uh, it would take uh, 0 0.025 liters of gasoline to uh, be equivalent to that 14.7 liters of air. And I came up with that answer with very simple uh, math. You just do 14.7 and divide that by uh, 587.5, which is how much more dense gasoline is than air, and you get 0 0.025, 0 0.212, or just 0 0.025. Now, if you want to find out how much gasoline you need to burn that air, you need to actually divide this number again by 14.7. So you do 0 0.025 divided by 14.7, and you get 1.7 times 10 to the negative 3 liters of gasoline, or 1.7 milliliters so you need 1.7 milliliters of fuel to burn or to react with 14.7 liters of air so this is just a, a way to show that you need a tiny tiny amount of fuel by volume to burn a given amount of air now how do we know how do we figure out how much air is in the cylinder well there are many different ways that uh, the car's computer does that. So the question here is, how much air is in the cylinder? A car can use many different um, methods or sensors. One way is uh, it uses something called a manifold absolute pressure sensor. A manifold absolute pressure sensor does uh, exactly what it sounds like. It measures the pressure. But it doesn't measure the pressure in the way most people are used to. If you ever inflated a tire or inflated a, um, a tank or anything like that, the pressure on that gauge is what's known as gauge pressure. It's assuming that the air or the pressure around you is zero and then comparing to that. An absolute pressure sensor does not do that. It doesn't compare from outside pressure. It compares from an absolute vacuum. An absolute vacuum has an absolute pressure of zero atmospheres. What an absolute vacuum is, is an area that has absolutely nothing in it, no molecules, nothing at all. That would be a pressure of zero. And an absolute pressure sensor would measure that as zero as well. A gauge pressure sensor would actually measure that as negative pressure, but that's not, that's not the case here. Uh, the pressure um, at sea level is considered one atmosphere, and this is what uh, a pressure sensor reads. Now, the reason that this is important for measuring the amount of air in the cylinder is that the uh, amount of uh, air molecules in a given volume is proportional to its pressure. So this is a very good approximation to how much fluid you're going to need. If the engine computer knows how much pressure is in the intake manifold, it can give a reasonably good assumption to how much fuel it's going to need to uh, inject into it given the pressure of the air in it. But it's not close enough. Uh, cars use something else to help uh, compensate for that and they use what's known as an intake air temperature sensor. An intake air temperature sensor does just what it says on the tin. It measures the temperature of the air inside the intake manifold. And it's more like a tweaking device. It You, you take the uh, the amount of pressure uh, or the amount of air you would measure from a given pressure, and then uh, either increase or decrease the amount of air molecules depending on the temperature. So if the temperature is high, the density goes down. 
if the temperature is low, then the density goes up. So that's how a um, intake air temperature sensor helps the car computer understand how much air is in the intake manifold. Now, not all cars use a mass uh, manifold absolute pressure sensor. Uh, some cars use something called a mass airflow sensor. And I actually have an example of one right here. This is a uh, mass airflow sensor. And this is, I think, off a Volkswagen. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at the, uh, let me get a pointer. Uh, there's this little red glass thing here. That's actually the intake air temperature sensor of the mass airflow. But behind it, there are these resistors. And these resistors uh, are heated up to a certain temperature. And depending on how much air passes through it, it cools it down. And then the uh, circuitry inside tries to keep it at a constant temperature by uh, passing more current through it. And the more current uh, that passes through that resistor, uh, the more air is is flowing through it and that's how it calculates how much air is passing uh, is going past the sensor and it's usually given uh, as a number like grams per second or pounds per minute or just some mass over a given amount of time and if the engine computer knows the engine displacement the number of cylinders and the engine speed as well as the uh, air temperature it can calculate how much air is in the cylinder using the uh, mass airflow sensor. Uh, a car like mine, which is a uh, Mazda 3, actually uses a mass airflow intake air temperature and a manifold absolute pressure sensor to measure how much uh, air is going into the cylinder. Another thing that affects how much air is in the cylinder, which is the the question we're trying to answer is something called volumetric efficiency. Now volumetric efficiency is a bit tricky. Uh, it's not something that is measured directly by the car, although there are some parameters that kind of tweak it. But a definition of it could be a measure comparing the density of air inside of the cylinder and the density of the air outside of the engine. Now basically what that means is it's it wants, it's a way of measuring how efficiently the engine can breathe. It's a number that tells you uh, once the uh, cylinder is completely full of air and the throttle is wide open and there's uh, no restriction to the air flowing into the engine, how much of, uh, how well can the cylinder be filled as compared to the uh, air that's on the outside? And it's usually given as a percentage. Uh, most cars, have a volumetric efficiency between 85 and 95 percent. Some cars can actually go above 100 percent using something like a turbocharger or a supercharger. A uh, turbocharger or supercharger uses forced induction to literally force air into the engine. And while doing so, it can actually have the volumetric efficiency be over 100 percent because inside of the cylinder is more air than would normally be in there if there was nothing forcing the air to go in there. And things that can affect uh, volumetric efficiency besides a turbocharger and a supercharger would be engine speed or RPM. The faster that the engine is spinning, the less time that the intake valve is open to allow air to come in. And that uh, can actually decrease uh, while the engine speed is increasing because there's just less time. So sometimes uh, manufacturers uh, use other tricks. For example, variable valve timing, variable valve lift and duration, and even uh, intake manifold runner control. The biggest thing that affects uh, volumetric efficiency is throttle angle. If you can imagine the throttle angle, that's got to be the biggest thing that affects volumetric efficiency. If the throttle is completely closed or partially closed, the air cannot get through easily. So the amount of air inside of the engine cylinder will be much, much less than the amount of air uh, out in the atmosphere, but that is on purpose. This isn't really a, a, a measure of efficiency, but more of a measure of you want to control how much power the engine is outputting. You can imagine if you're just putting around in traffic, you don't want the engine screaming at maximum horsepower. So this is just another thing to consider. It's not as important as the other um, components, but it is something that the engine computer does take into account. The last thing is 
fuel injector design, which, uh, <clears throat> which affects how long the um, fuel injector is turned on. If the fuel injector can flow very well or has a, a big orifice or is a large injector or is a high flow injector and there's very, very little demand for fuel, the fuel injector will only need to be open for a very short amount of time. Whereas if you have a less well-built injector, one that's more normal or one that can't flow very well, for the same amount of fuel, you will have to open the injector for a longer amount of time. Uh, fuel pressure is similar in that regard. The more pressure you have, the less time you need to open the injector. The less fuel pressure you have, the more time you need to open the injector to allow the same amount of fuel. These two things are usually uh, monitored by the engine computer. Well, fuel injector design is something that's programmed into it. Fuel pressure is usually programmed into it, but a lot of cars nowadays now have fuel pressure sensors that can directly tell the car computer how much fuel pressure there is and uh, it can adjust a fuel injector pulse width accordingly. Fuel temperature is not something that's measured too often. I think I've seen it in some Volkswagens and Audis but uh, I can't think of any other car that actually has a fuel temperature sensor, but fuel temperature does have an effect on, uh, has an effect on the air fuel ratio because of the same reason that the air temperature has an effect on air fuel ratio. If it has, if the fuel temperature is low, the fuel is denser, more fuel goes in, and the uh, air fuel ratio goes down. And the opposite is true too. And the last thing is something that's usually not thought of and is usually not that important, but it's something I wanted to mention anyway, is fuel oxygen content, which should be standard. It should not change too much uh, from car to car, pump to pump. Now, this is what the engine computer uses to calculate pulse width for a given situation. Whether that amount is correct depends on everything working perfectly. The injector can't be clogged or leaking. There can't be any leaks in the intake manifold. The sensors have to be reading accurately. If any of that goes wrong, then it throws off the numbers. It can throw it off wildly, actually. So that's why there is an oxygen sensor or air fuel ratio sensor in the exhaust. Um, an oxygen sensor is, does just what it, it says. It measures the oxygen level in the exhaust and depending on how much oxygen is in the exhaust it is proportional to the air fuel ratio that was uh, that was uh, burned so if the uh, engine computer is reading an oxygen sensor level or oxygen level that is higher than it should be or lower than it should be it will adjust adjust the pulse width of the injector accordingly if it uh, if it has to move it more than a certain amount the check engine light might actually turn on with a lean or rich condition an air fuel ratio sensor is very similar to an oxygen sensor, except that it's much more accurate. An oxygen sensor reads only uh, lean or rich. Lean or rich. Whereas a air fuel ratio sensor can tell you precisely how lean and how rich, which is an important distinction because if an oxygen sensor is just telling you rich, then all you know is you need to decrease the pulses, but you're not sure by how much yet. Whereas an air fuel ratio sensor can tell you that it's running rich or lean and can tell you how much it needs to increase or, or, the, or the engine computer can calculate how much it needs to increase or decrease the pulse width. So that's basically it. Um, there's not much more to it. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing some things that I'm, I'm uh, not thinking about. But uh, this is basically the, uh, the way that modern engine computers use to calculate how much fuel uh, an engine needs for a given amount of time. So uh, thank you for watching. I hope you guys uh, learned something and enjoyed it. And make sure to watch the other videos if you're interested. Thank you.